reading today is from Matthew 4, verse 17, to chapter 5, verse 12. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. And he went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, those having seizures and paralytics, and he healed them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis, and from Jerusalem and Judea, and from beyond the Jordan. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for, they, for the, so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you. For someone who has not worked full time professionally with children, I have a lot of children experience. It all started when I was a child. But then later on, I became a uh, a camp counselor, both day camp and sleepaway camp. And my specialty ended up being for years, uh, nine and 10 year old boys. And so fairly young children, um, even though I'm not talking about toddlers. But then, of course, then a year after Robin and I got married, we started having children, not knowing the one would become two and then three and then four and up to ten. And so that's a lot of children experience. And um, so I've played a lot of games with children. And one of my favorites has been Simon Says, but not normal Simon Says. I can't remember what TV show it was on. The best I could do in my memory is going back a long ways because I remember doing Simon Says like this with kids when I was still a teenager. Um, And so I must have been flipping the channels and came upon um, adult Simon Says. It was part of some other show and there was some guy who was a specialist in adult Simon Says and he just he 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 was it was rough um and how he was able to get people out so easily that when as kids we were taught you know when I say Simon Says do this then you do it and then if I say do that then if you do it you're out but the way this person played it was uh only if he said Simon Says and you didn't have to say, Simon says, do this. So Simon says, smile, you smile. But if, if you say, clap, and you clap, you're out. And so it would be fast and furious, and the kids loved it. 
And of course, I loved it because I'm a little bit of a control freak. Um, so it's a great game to play. And uh, anyway, I just loved playing Simon Says, especially having learned from this professional Simon Says player. I, I bring that up because we're going to be looking in the next few weeks at what it means to follow Jesus. And to follow Jesus means to play, quote unquote, Jesus Says. And it really comes down to, to follow Jesus is if Jesus says, do it or don't do it, we do it or don't do it. And if he doesn't say it, and you do it, you're out. No, not, not quite. That's why we have our confession every week. But we're supposed to do what Jesus says. And hopefully we're going to see that unlike the control freak, me who liked getting people out and everyone would laugh and that sort of thing, and, um, and I would get to be the person, you know, playing as well, and I would go out too. So, um, and that's all just for fun. And God isn't there. I, I get the impression that some people may have grown up with this idea that if you messed up once with God, you know, you're out kind of thing, and you're finished. And that's just not biblical. And again, that's why we do confession every week and should do confession every day. And if we, if we pray the Lord's Prayer every day from our hearts, we're asking God to forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And we looked at that a few times as we went through 1 John. 1 John has such a high standard of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. At the same time, there's room for restoration all the time. And praise God for that. But be, we shouldn't think that because there is room for restoration, that we should take God for granted and that we... Um, should not think that we must, should not, I'm getting mixed up with my negatives here. We must take the call to follow Jesus very, very seriously. We're in crucial times. We are living in a day that's unlike any day that I've lived in. For what I can tell, I don't know if we've ever lived in a time period exactly like this. And of course, that's always true. Um, there have been worse times. You may have lived through worse times than this. Now, of course, whatever your personal worst times have been, they're the worst times for you. And maybe it's how you cope with the confusing, troubling times we're in right now as you remember those days that were way worse. The people that have been on deathbeds or their loved ones have been on deathbeds and that was difficult enough. Some of them survived, but you remember how horrible that time was. And maybe you go back there and you count your blessings because you survived that horrible thing. Some of you have lived in countries with war and where you saw death all around you. Till now, I've never, I've never experienced anything like that. I've had, I have my own traumas and difficulties from the past, and I do at times remember how much better these times are from some of those times. But these times that we're in right now are unprecedented in many ways. And people are being affected in their own lives in ways they've never experienced before. There are people that um, are losing their jobs today that maybe they never faced that before. And again, some of you have been through worse times. Some of you have been through times where you literally had no food for days. And, and you know, how do you compare one person's trouble to another? We really shouldn't. One of the things I've observed, though, about these days, and I've never seen this before, I've been seeing people behaving in ways they've never behaved before. People's thinking is warped. People are afraid at a level I've never seen them afraid before. Some of the illogical things that people have been saying I've never seen before. And I can give the caveat of maybe it's just me. Maybe it's just how I, I'm experiencing these days. But this is what I've been seeing. This is what I've been hearing other people saying. And so... what. what when we looked at the, we just finished 
my series on the end times, I tried to make a biblical case to show that according to the New Testament, we've always been in the end times or the last days. That the coming of Jesus began that period of time of a cosmic battle, initiated in a sense by God in his pushing back the darkness. And we have, many of us believed the misnomer that with the coming of Jesus and his pushing back the darkness, that things should just be okay all the time sort of thing, but far from it. Because with the coming of Jesus, he agitates life. He agitates our own lives, especially if we don't cooperate with what he wants to do in our lives. The darkness doesn't, you know, we could use an illustration of going into a room and lighting a match. And the, and the Bible says the darkness can't overcome the light. But in, an, in a sense, metaphorically, the, the darkness doesn't give up that easy. And we saw in the end time series and then before that in First John that there are troublemakers within the family of God and whatever their status really is in God's family, that's for God to decide. But that we're warned against false teachers and false teaching and, and this sort of thing. And so we need to be on guard. We need to be paying attention. Now, when I would play Simon Says in the way I I've learned to do it playing for keeps, so to speak. I go all out in trying to get people distracted. Um, you, you know, you might think low of me, but you know, I would say, you know, I'd, I'd go up to one person, and this also would make it more fun instead of doing it with a group. I'd go to one person, especially someone who's really, really good, very difficult to get out. Uh, you no, know, clap, you know, cl Simon says clap. Simon says stop. Uh, Simon says stand on one foot. I'd make a joke. You know, Simon says, you know, uh, lift up both feet. You know, tell him to try to do something impossible, get the people to laugh. And uh, then, you know, Simon says, clap. And, oh, oh, aren't, didn't you go out, I'd say? And they go, no, now you are. Isn't that terrible? But it's fun, playing a game with kids. But the devil, the devil does play for keeps. Evil's nasty. Nile, another child's game, you, you, you know, you'd think it's not fair. You, you blindfold the kid and spin him around a few times and then put this tail in his hand and expect him to, to put the, the tail in the right place on the donkey. And of course, he's, most are going to get it wrong except for the wise, wise, the, the, you know, the wise guy kids that knows, well, if I touch the paper with the donkey with the crease and the crease and then go six inches over to the left, that's where I'm supposed to put the tail. But if they don't realize that, the chances are they're gonna put it in a very ridiculous place and everybody laughs. The devil doesn't laugh as we get spun around by the circumstances of life and we get all disoriented and out of whack. And yet God expects us to not be focused on the, the disorientations that we experience, but to focus on him and his word, for that is the only path of life. The whole world is in disorientation, and that has simply gotten worse over the past year and a half. In fact, I believe one of the reasons why the COVID age has been difficult is because how we've already been prepped. I've tried to talk about that recently a little bit. We've been prepped. We've learned to rely on human ingenuity more and more through the years. We've been building a grand tower of Babel of technology, whether that's technology, in, uh, medical science technology, or communication technology, and all the rest, we so rely on the works of our hands that we don't know what to do when our towers of Babel are, become challenged. We really believe that human beings have the capability to get ourselves out of any and all messes, even though history tells us otherwise. 
We're still here because of the faithfulness of God in the midst of human misguidedness and dysfunction. And so many of the good things that we've experienced in the world, in history, has become because of people of goodwill who have sought God, had been used by God, have helped to get us out of many messes. The Bible tells us the reason why we're still here, even though we live in a, in a, uh, a world that's so full of evil and devastation, is because God is being patient with us that we would turn to him. But turning to him is not about simply saying a prayer, having a religious experience, or being in the right fellowship, whatever that might be. Following him is a daily and momentary act of listening to Jesus and following his lead. The words for follow in the New Testament that are, get translated like come along or go with me or follow can simply mean how we might use it. Um, you know, you go to the restaurant and um, you say you have a, a, re a reservation and the, the host or hostess says, follow me. I will take you to your table and just follow along going where that person is going, and they'll take you, hopefully, to the right place. But also, the New Testament uses it in this more metaphorical way, if as a figure of speech, as in joining a leader in their mission. The call to follow a teacher was a thing in the first century. Sometimes a person would seek out a teacher to follow, meaning learn from them and go wherever they're going and do what they're doing, or to be called by a teacher to follow them. And, and we see this in the life of Jesus. Sometimes he called people to follow him, and others would join along or they would ask to, to be a follower. But one of the things about following a teacher in the first century Jewish world was not simply to be a student in the way that we think of students today. The word disciple can mean student. And a student today, we attend a class, maybe do the homework, do some tests, get a mark, have several teachers. And a teacher today, for the most part, is a person who imparts information. But that's not how a first century Jewish teacher or rabbi conducted himself with their students. To follow a teacher meant to become like him in every way. Yes, to learn from the information that they were sharing, but to do the things that they did. And very often a student of those days would even copy the mannerisms of their teacher. In Luke chapter 6, verses 39 to 40, we read, he also told them a parable. Can a blind man lead a blind man? Will they not both fall into a pit? A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone when he is fully trained will be like his teacher. This is the goal of Rabbi Jesus, that his disciples would become just like him. 1 John 4, verse 17 says, as he is, how Je as Jesus is, so also are we in this world. John had an expectation that the true follower, the true disciple of Jesus would emulate Jesus would function like Jesus, would act like Jesus. In order to act like Jesus, we need to truly follow him. And I want to share a clip with you. Hopefully this will work. As you know, we've been having struggles with our technology. We test it before the service. It's a, before you start, 
It's a two and a half minute clip from the show, The Chosen, which you've heard me mention before. The Chosen, in case you don't know, is the ever first multi-season story of the life of Jesus. It's very different in that it tells the story of Jesus not from his own perspective, which is how every other Jesus film works. Instead, it tells the story of Jesus from the perspective of the people whose lives they cha he changed. There have been two seasons so far, 16 episodes. You can see them at thechosen.tv. Thechosen.tv, you can get all the information there. Season three is currently in development. So what you're going to see, don't start yet, what you're going to see is the call of Matthew. Matthew was a tax collector. Tax collectors were some of the most hated people in Jewish society in first century Israel. They were hated because not only did they work for the foreign oppressor, Rome, they were in the way they worked, if they were able to extract extra tax from you, they would be able to keep the difference. They were seen as the lowest of the low in that society along with prostitutes. As you watch this clip, I trust much of it will be self-explanatory, you're going to see a reaction from one of the other disciples uh, when Jesus calls Matthew. The one who's reacting in that way is Peter. Peter, called, his name was originally Simon. I don't think his name is mentioned in the clip. Simon, along with three other of the disciples, were commercial fishermen. Commercial fishermen especially did not like tax collectors. And so hopefully it's going to work. If you have trouble with it, just restart it. in the same it. world, Matthew. Next. Besides, what else are you going to do with a mind like yours? Matthew! Matthew, son of Alphaeus! Yes. Follow me. Me? <laughs> yes, you. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh. What are you doing? You want me to join you? Keep moving, street preacher. Do you have any idea what this guy's done? Do you even know him? Yes. Listen, I said to What are you doing? Where do you think you're going? Guys, let me go. Have you lost your mind? You have money. Quintus protects you. No Jew lives as good as you. You're gonna throw it all away. You didn't get it when I chose you either. But this is different. I'm not a tax collector. Get used to different. I'm glad we passed by your booth today, Matthew. Yes. Shall we? We have a celebration to prepare for. You will regret this, Matthew. What's the tablet for? Grabbed it without thinking. You can put it back. No, no, keep it. You may yet find use for it. Where are we going? A dinner party. I'm not welcome at dinner parties. Well, that's not going to be a problem tonight. You're the host. I don't get. I don't get tired of that clip. 
get used to different. I know it's not a line out of the Bible. But it captures one of the many aspects of what it means to follow Jesus. Get used to different. The reason why I shared the clip, however, is because of how the actor playing Jesus reads his line, follow me. I always read it as follow me. Follow me, says Jesus. And that's because, rightly so, our attention is on Jesus. Who do we follow? Jesus. Our focus is on Jesus. But several times in the show, when he says, follow me, he doesn't say follow me. He says, follow me. And it really struck me. Follow me. There's a tendency to forget that there's a call and a call that we have to respond to. Yes, the focus, of course, needs to be on Jesus. But our, our focus needs to be on Jesus. And it's not a focus simply of admiration. Yes, of course, we should admire him. I've mentioned this before, though. We don't admire him like fans. Just all excited about Jesus and about what Jesus has done. We should be excited about what Jesus has done and is doing. But we don't, we're not in the audience applauding his exploits. We've been called to join him in his exploits. We've been called to be participants in his mission. Jesus doesn't come and grab us and drag us along. He calls us to follow. This is reflected well in Psalm 32, verses 8 and 9. We read, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Do not be not like a horse or mule without understanding, which must be curbed with bit and bridle, or it will not stay near you. We're not supposed to be like horses or mules, dragged by our teeth by God. But I wonder how many people have even prayed prayers. Lord, if you want me to do such and such, you know, make it happen. I understand prayers where we might pray, Lord, if this is of you, open the door. Though sometimes I think the Lord's word to us is knock harder and sometimes bang it down if you have to. How do you know when it's time to bang down a door of resistance in our life? Or if that door has been closed by God and we should go and do something else? How are we to know that? God will tell us. I've often prayed a prayer when we have faced an obstacle. Lord, show me if this is a mountain that needs to be moved or a door that you are closing. How are we to know the difference? Is, are the obstacles we're facing of God and we should respond accordingly? Or is the obstacle there an opportunity to exercise faith in God that he would remove the obstacle? Many years ago, we were in a situation where we were stuck in a lease and, and we had opportunity to move to another city and we believe this opportunity was from God. I'm trying to make a long story very short. After months of prayer and months of counsel, we came to the conclusion, we were living in Montreal at the time, that we needed to move back where we had been before to the West Coast. And we were renting and we couldn't get out of our lease and trying to sublet the house was, was you would not believe 
uh, the, the, the troubles that we encountered and we just could not get out. I even asked the landlady to come over so I could explain to her our need of having to leave and I kind of tried to pull a let my people go and it didn't work. And then one day we were having, and I'm sorry if I've told this story before, I can't remember. One day uh, in those days, we had a lot of children at home and we would have family Bible time in the morning and we read one of the, if you have faith to move the mountain, just say to it and it'll move. And I read it and it came to my heart that our situation with our house was a mountain that needed to be moved. It just somehow knew in my knower couldn't make it happen and so I called up a pastor friend of mine that lived nearby and what we did was is we went and we stood uh, near where the landlady who owned the house was living and we stood there together and we prayed that God would move the mountain and my friend after we prayed he said I believe that the obstacle that you're facing is of the devil now I don't tend to talk that way, and my friend doesn't tend to talk that way, unless it was something that was very heavy in his heart. Again, just because he said that didn't mean that, you know, what, what does that actually mean? He said that, it was a bit encouraging, and we had set the deadline for that evening to be when we would change our plans and, and accept the fact that we couldn't move. Then a week went by, and the phone rang. It was the landlady. Make another long story short, she told us that we could leave. And it was just, it was so, it was so bizarre because emotionally I'd gone through so much of months of seeking God on this. And we had our dramatic thing the week before and it didn't work. So I was hesitant to accept her offer. And I called the pastor of the church that we were going to be moving to in Vancouver to tell him what happened. And I remember as I told him what happened, he said, Sounds like a miracle. I'd go with the miracle. And we did. And I believe to this day that that dramatic thing was of the Lord. It's all to say, how do you know? How do we know how to deal with the day that we're in right now? Do we listen to the news? And let the news tell us what to do? Do we listen to other people? And just do what other people say to do. And I don't know if any of you listened to or watched my two-part podcast on our relationship to government. But any thought that we're supposed to play Simon Says with the government is not of God. We are to respect the government. We're to honor but when government crosses the line, wherever that might be, which I'm not commenting on this morning, because that's not the point. Because whatever the lesson is for today is what a lot of people want. They want to be told, I've seen this with Christians. I've seen Christians do this with theology and Bible, which, with charismatic things and non-charismatic things. They're not following Jesus. They're following something else. They're following pastors and teachers. They're following fears. They're following what, what, what granddad said, what granddad died for. Not what Jesus died for. We're often more committed to our churches, our denominations, our movements, our experiences. And now, people who should know better, oh, I just do what the experts say. Because the experts say it? When Jesus said, follow me, he disengaged us from necessary obligations to every other authority. He alone is king. He's the son of God. He's the only one who's always right. And I would rather risk obedience to Jesus than obedience to anything else. And if in my attempt to listen to him and to follow him, I make a mistake, 
My life is committed to him. And certainly, some of the mistakes I've made have affected my family in, in, in bad ways. But God is still greater than them all. Where does faith fit in to being a follower? Well, it's core. Of course it is. We're saved by faith. But biblical faith is active, not passive. Biblical faith is not a state of mind. It's trusting. You know what you have faith in based on what you rely on. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, Proverbs 3, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. What do we rely on? Our own understanding, our own desires, what other people expect of us, what the government says, what whoever says? What do we rely on? If Jesus is not sufficient to be relied on, then this whole thing that we do call church is a phony. What in the world are we doing here? But if like what we saw imaged in that clip, is he, if he really is worth leaving, our comfy jobs and government protection like Matthew had to pursue the King of Kings and Lord of Lords who has conquered evil, has conquered death, who is all wise and all true. Am I crazy? Or is everybody else crazy to follow popular opinion, to follow the science? I've commented on this before. Science is great as a tool. An ever-changing investigative tool when used rightly within the confines of God's will has been so helpful. But it must be subservient to the higher values and ways of God, or else we will kill each other with science. It's happened before, it'll happen again. Everyone's a follower. Maybe you think you're not. Maybe you think you're a self-made person and you're self-directed. My humble opinion says, no, there's no such thing. Most of us are following something that we've been taught, maybe since we were children, or we picked up along the way. Most of us want to fit in with some group somewhere that makes us feel like we belong. Some people are driven by their desires and by pleasure and by addictions. But that's not the real you. The real you is made in the image of God and designed to follow our Heavenly Father. We're either rebels or we're servants. I know servant is a lowly place, is a lowly, um, there's a word for it, station in life. But to be a servant of the Most High God is to experience that which we've been de designed for. To fulfill his purposes in the world, whatever they might be. And please, may God help us to, to cast away impressions we have of what a real godly person should be. This has also been so disruptive for God's people as we have these images. You know, Mother Teresa, you know, if I'm not like Mother Teresa, then what kind of servant of God am I? 
What are you called to? Where is God leading you? What does Jesus want you to do? Over the next few weeks, we'll explore further what following Jesus is all about. But this is the only pathway for life, the only way to not be swallowed up by whatever's going on, and it's been going on since before COVID, the encroachment upon our lives. To think we live in a country today, brothers and sisters, where a judge has told a pastor in Alberta what he is supposed to say. This is not Soviet rule. This is not Nazi rule. This is Canada. And God help us if we think that's a right thing, that, that, that's good and right. That people are now being compelled by the courts what they should say. It might start with COVID, it will not end with COVID. And I'm not saying we should take the government on and we should take the courts on. May God guide us in, in, in the ways that we are to respond. The only real question is, are we doing what Jesus wants us to do? Are we going to wake up, we're going to see that the encroaching darkness and learn to follow the light and be vessels of God's rescue to other people who at this point don't know any better? We are the trainees, the apprentices of Jesus. And we have been assigned to set the captives free. Will we or will we not follow him? Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your call. Each one of us is in our own, has been or is in our own tax collector's booth. A sense, rightly or wrongly, of security and protection. And then comes your call. A call into the great unknown of life and goodness and love. And being assigned to be your instruments of all that in the world today. Open our ears afresh or for the first time to hear your voice and help us to see where you are leading us today. In Jesus' name, amen.